So today we're going to be talking about uh, medieval female mystics. Uh, now we often hear about prominent male mystics uh, during the Middle Ages. Uh, you can think of a few like St. Bernard, and Francis of Assisi, and Bernard of Clairvaux, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, we have to realize that during the what is called the High Middle Ages, this is an era of many female mystics uh, who either sought a, a deeper role within the church or to reaffirm their own unique relationship with God uh, that uh, really in many ways uh, transcended uh, patriarchal culture. While not permitted to teach uh, within the West because of the traditional ecclesiastical hierarchy, um, through their mystical relationship that they believed they had through God, women discovered new avenues of authority uh, to instruct and to inspire others uh, to the point that they believed that they didn't need the sanction of the church. Uh, for after all, uh, their experiences were arriving directly from God, right? Directly uh, from the Holy Spirit. And so for a period of time, the medieval church took note and actually validated this mode of expression as authoritative, at least uh, for a little while, right? Mystics like Hildegard of Bingen, right, and St. Catherine of Siena, right, are examples of this. They were even able to advise popes who seriously considered their words with as much gravitas as a man. Many female mystics view themselves as mystically married to God, using imagery as beautiful uh, as it is passionate, right? And even, well, and even erotic at times. <laughs> Bertrude uh, of Helfta, for example, and Julian of Norwich are really good examples of this. A few female mystics were associated with all female communities, uh, known as the Big Queens, who are under their own rule as governed by a grand mistress, uh, such, as, such as Beatrice of Nazareth and Hadavak of Antwerp, right? And many female mystics found themselves persecuted later on by the Inquisition, often accused of witchcraft. A Margaret Corte, right, for example, was burned at the stake. So, so this, is, this is the topic. We're going to be covering quite a spread. <laughs> Well, let's jump into it right away. Now, uh, a scholar by the name of Valerie Marie Loguerio, in her essay, The Medieval Continent of Women Mystics, uh, mentions the fact, and she quotes even Evelyn Underhill, in support of the idea that mysticism not only seems to intensify in certain periods, but it is in itself richly creative. The great periods of mystical activity uh, tend to correspond with great periods of artistic, material, and intellectual civilization. It is always as if the mystic were humanity's finest flower, the product at which each great creative period of race had aimed. It's interesting because during the most creative epics, historically, mystics do appear. Um, I'm going to give an example that a, a for example, towards the end of what we know as the Byzantine Empire, towards that very end, uh, when it's you know Islam, you know Islam is is surrounding through the Ottomans, uh, Constantinople, it looks like the end of an epic. Yet this was the finest expression of of Byzantine culture and literature and art, but also it was noted as a time of its high mysticism. And of course, the famous Hesychus prayer uh, was, was, uh, became very popularized during this period of time. So yes, this is just, it happens. It's very interesting. So of course, for the West, one such time uh, is the high middle ages in Europe, uh, roughly speaking between 1100 to 1450. Uh, this is a time of great change. Uh, this is a period where 
the society is moving away from the, the feudal system uh, and giving away to uh, cities and a, and a new middle class and capitalism, right? Uh, uh, this, I know we think of this time as, a, as an age of faith, and mysticism is not a retreat from it, but it is a reality that builds upon that faith uh, and then emphasizes it in other ways. Uh, mystics were the teachers of the age. Uh, they were leaders. Uh, and in many cases, they put together Christian traditions and brought it together with new ideas of understanding the relationship of God and humanity. Uh, their role uh, was that of prophets and healers, right? Medieval mysticism was primarily visual as well as effective. The mystic saw and felt truth. It saw God or Christ or the saints, and it was filled with love for uh, what uh, she had seen. Uh, I want to say this is that is that this is a period of time where it is believed not just simply in the heart, in one's faith, but in reality, they're actually experiencing God. They're actually seeing with their visual eyes Jesus and Mary and various saints, and not just seeing, but hearing and feeling, and even having the scent smelling this mysticism, the fragrance of a rose or perfumed air. And women were at the heart of this movement, very much so. Although uh, medieval uh, women mystics came from different classes, uh, from all parts of Europe, and they did experience uh, their uh, spiritual inauguration at a different, you know, uh, ages, so to speak. Uh, for the most part, uh, the majority of these mystics, these female mystics, uh, were virgins, or they were beyond childbearing years. Uh, so they were in many cases, there are widows as well. So, uh, but uh, you typically the female mystics were not at the same time involved with family life, uh, with, with husbands and taking care of kids, right? But uh, in many cases, after that period is over, then they would end up moving on to this new phase. But oftentimes, a lot of the examples that we're giving, uh, the female mystics started right out from the beginning. Right from childhood on, uh, they felt this special call, right? Uh, this vision uh, that moved through uh, a uh, beyond the ecclesiastical hierarchy, right? Uh, so there you have it. Uh, medieval society believed women must be protected from violence and from their own sexuality, uh, and women were thought to be naturally passive uh, and meditative and receptive. Well, what happened in many cases is the role of the female mystic, sometimes it did embrace some of these ideas, but it also challenged them. Until the 14th century, the religious community was the only place in which uh, a, a woman was able to find a library, right? As well as other scholars, as well as an opportunity uh, to read and to write. So much like we found within Buddhism, right? Uh, women realized that joining uh, the, uh, the community life, the communal life, the celibate life uh, within these uh, within the walls, uh, after vowing, uh, you know, to to stay, uh, you know, obviously chaste, uh, that they found that. Uh, well, they can uh, have other opportunities, right? You found in Buddhism, uh, you learn how to read, you learn how to write, you learn how to copy various manuscripts. So in many cases, even in Western Europe, this became an opportunity for women to read, uh, to learn how to read, to learn how to write. 
And yes, I'm going to give you very specific examples of this when I talk about these uh, the various mistakes. So we're going to go into detail. Uh, so I'm not going to leave this as unsupported evidence. <laughs> You're going to see it or hear it, I should say, uh, for yourself. Um, women uh, tended to write more personal devotional works uh, than men uh, during these times, these opportunities. Uh, I want to mention something else. And I have to, I want to spend too much time on it. But uh, in, in many of these writings by these female mystics, there are indications that uh, they uh, were influenced by the female troubadours. Uh, the troubadours uh, were uh, female troubadours. Uh, of the 12th and 13th centuries. Uh, they were busy, uh, pretty active around 1170, uh, and then on to around 1260. Uh, their areas of prominence is the southern half of France, um, of Spain, uh, parts of Italy, uh, Monaco, for example. And so throughout this period of time, women uh, who are in the court uh, were expected to be able to, to sing, uh, to play instruments, uh, and to write um, a form of a, of, a, of a poem. And so this is the expected cultivation of women uh, within these courts. And so they were, in a sense, these are female troubadours, right? Um, now, what happened is, is that uh, uh, many read these works and many of the female mystics that we will talk about also read these works, but as opposed to this, uh, uh, this chivalric conception of, of, of lovers that can never ever meet, right? You know, but loving from afar, uh, that idea will be applied uh, to a relationship with God, right? So, and we'll go into that. So in many cases, uh, the, the writings of these female mystics resemble a courtly love. And, and so it puts courtly love within the context of, of mysticism. So uh, now I do have to say that uh, uh, women's uh, mysticism was a little more austere, austere excuse me, than the, the males. Uh, uh, they were a little harder uh, when it comes to on themselves. Uh, we could go in this a little bit, uh, but uh, there we have it. Uh, during the 12th century, the Latin West began to be inundated in what's called wisdom literature and the contemplation of the role of Sophia, known as Sapienta uh, in Latin, uh, with uh, Christian leaders like Sir St. Bernard, right, uh, taking a look at the Song of Songs and the wisdom literature within the book of Psalms and, and Proverbs and Ecclesiasticus, right? And so uh, the concept here, and I'll go into it briefly, is that uh, you know, basically within the spirit of God that we see in the Hebrew Bible, uh, you have three aspects, right? You know, Yahruha, right? Which is the breath, the breath of God. This is the creative aspect that, uh, that moves and, and, and gives life, right? And then uh, you have uh, Shekinah, right? Shekinah, uh, this is the tabernacling aspect. This is the indwelling spirit of God. Uh, this is also uh, Lech Ruha. It's in, uh, uh, Shekinah is also feminine. But you, but you have something out called Chokma. Chokma, uh, and translated uh, into Greek, it's Sophia, and translated into English, it's wisdom, right? Uh, this is another aspect of the spirit of God that indwells uh, gives one wisdom, and you're going to see this theme uh, in the Hebrew Bible, and it's going to be expanded upon uh, in Jewish writings, but also within Christian writings. And uh, I do want to say this, in many cases, we will see that this idea of Sophia, wisdom of God, uh, for example, the Gospel of Luke, will be connected to the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit, therefore, is wisdom. It's the Spirit of Wisdom. And uh, so you have this concept, and this goes into Christianity, and this idea then goes into the West. And so uh, St. Bernard, uh, not to be confused with the beautiful God, right? Uh, St. Bernard uh, 
values these ideas and the Cistercians in general spread these ideas of this feminine aspect of God and looked at as, uh, in a sense, a consort, but still part of God. In some cases, looked at as a creatrix, right? Such discussions, of course, open up the idea of the feminine aspect of God uh, in medieval theology, uh, and as a result, would become a vital step for female mystics to participate in these conversations as full women, uh, no longer denigrating themselves, for it reflected the idea that uh, that humanity, right, male and female, were both made in God's image. And was that not what the book of Genesis actually did say? Both right, are the image of God. So you have this concept of uh, being reflected. Okay. Now, according to Elizabeth Avilda Petroff, uh, there are uh, about seven different stages that we see these female mystics go through. And we'll talk about that for a little bit, and then we're going to move on to uh, one other topic, and then we'll jump into various female mystics. Uh, first of all, first step that we're going to see, so you may want to write these down, uh, because I want you to be able to kind of track uh, these stages as you see them in the various female mystics that we're going to be exploring. And we're going to be exploring quite a few, so get ready. The first stage is known as the uh, purgative stage, the purgative stage. Uh, this is shown by uh, the, the mystic, the female mystic, being under constant demonic attack. So they're attacked by demons, right? Uh, by these, and sometimes these demons are demons of temptation, lust, of desire, right? And so anyway, so there, so basically, uh, there's a desire for true contrition expressing itself in fantasies of self-punishment, uh, degradation, and public humiliation. So this, you'll see this as we go along here. The second, uh, after the purgative stage, is known as the psychic stage. And this is about having vision. So after the being attacked by demons, right? Uh, and you know, now all of a sudden, you're having visions. Here, uh, the mystic begins to see outside herself, uh, and uh, starts to become spiritually concerned about the welfare of others, right? She sees visions. Oftentimes, she sees a vision of Jesus, uh, sometimes uh, Mary, sometimes the apostles, right? And it seems very tangible, right? Uh, so the next, the third stage is called the doctrinal stage. Uh, this is when these mystic visions focus upon the real needs in the church, that is to be addressed. And so uh, what happens is that during this stage, now that they have had these visions, now uh, these mystical experiences, they feel, uh, many of these female mystics now feel empowered uh, to comment because, you know, they are being um, sanctioned by the Spirit of God after all, right? Uh, comment on doctrine, you know, comment on, on theology. You know, so there's a dialogue now between the visionary uh, and their confessor. And you're going to see this a lot, uh, right down uh, to Hildegard of Bingen, right? So uh, when it comes to next, next to number four, this is the devotional stage. This is when the mystic devotes herself to specific meditation on a particular figure. So where before uh, they saw, you know, various visions, right? Now they are dedicated uh, to what? Uh, or a few devotional prayers to Jesus or to Mary or to a saint. You're going to see this a lot amongst the, uh, the female mystics who are Franciscans and Dominicans. Fifth is the uh, participatory stage. Participatory stage is when the mystic now appears to be participating in life of the one they're devoted to. So, so not just being devoted to, right, which is, of course, stage number four. Number five is they are now participating with them in their life, whether the Jesus 
or the Virgin Mary, uh, making their, these experiences personal, uh, very immediate, right? Uh, so they're feeling, they're in a sense of feeling the, uh, the, the, the passion uh, and the weeping of Mary, Mother Mary, and they don't just they don't just feel it, they become it. And so they're weeping as Mary before the cross. And so they're, they're crying, they're feeling uh, this sense of loss, uh, this idea. We, it also of uh, connecting with Christ and feeling uh, the sacrificial love and, and feeling the pain, uh, in some cases, the stigmata, right? Actualizing it. So, uh, yeah, this just goes into quite a bit. Number six, right? Uh, this is the unitive uh, stage. Some people call it the erotic stage, where the subject and the object began to mix as one. So, not more than just participating. Now it is mixing of the two, right? Uh, so, the idea it is uh, before where it was bride and Jesus as the bridegroom. Now it is the marriage, you know, the two commingling uh, together, right? Uh, moving together, working together, becoming one. Seventh, uh, it, this is the cosmic ordering stage. And this is the ultimate experience. It presents the feminine as the operative presence uh, in the cosmos. So the seventh stage is the idea of transcendence. Isn't that fascinating? So from participating uh, to, to mixing, right, uh, to becoming one, and then transcending uh, into the universe, right? Uh, so you're going to see this in many cases, right? Now, uh, one last thought, and I'll go here quickly, and that is female mystics are oftentimes connected uh, to the idea of purgatory, uh, which is interesting. Visionary women, uh, in many ways, um, uh, right from the beginning, you know? I mean, you're going to see, uh, obviously, if you read Dante's Inferno, right? You have Beatrice, right? Uh, uh, and, of course, uh, what happens is that he rem uh, she reminds Dante, remember this, uh, of another threshold long since crossed, uh, you know, and like Persephone or Isis or, or Inanna, she once visited the threshold of the dead, right? A blessed spirit, she has walked amongst the dead, descending from the throne of joy. She has offered up prayers and tears. By no means alone is Dante saved, as indeed he already knows. And of course, you know, so you have this idea. So you have this, idea. Uh, this kind of goes back to other uh, conceptions uh, way back when. Uh, in the first into the second century, you have a figure by the name of Thecla, right? And Thecla, who was supposed to be a disciple of the Apostle Paul, who's a mystic and a teacher. Uh, she maintained uh, her virginity. Uh, and um, one of her adventures, she was adopted by a certain queen who's very sympathetic to her beliefs and perspectives, whose daughter, Falconea, had died. Uh, Falconea reveals to her mother in a dream that Thecla can get her translated to the place of righteousness. Now, this is the first into the second centuries uh, the Acts of Thecla were written. And so the queen asked Thecla, uh, you know, on the eve before uh, Thecla is about to be placed before the wild beasts to be eaten alive, uh, well, what's supposed to happen, uh, to come and pray for my child so that she may live forever. Uh, and, so, uh, and so as a result, she is asked to pray. Well, this is, of course, this concept will start to move into a purgatorious sense. Same idea happens uh, in the first part of the third century with a female uh, mystic by the name of Perpetua, who left a diary behind of her experiences. Uh, she had a memory of her brother by the name of Denicotes, who had died at the age of seven, and she received a vision of her brother, seeing him in rags and thirsty, and still afflicted with the cancer uh, that took his life, and suddenly saw, and so what she did is she prayed, and suddenly saw him playing besides 
of the immortal fountain, fully healed with joy. So when the call to the saints uh, becomes more articulated, women uh, are often viewed as, as those with their, you know, um, through their mysticism, through their prayers, help those in purgatory to move along to the other side. And so we're going to, so, so, so a lot of these female mystics uh, are, are consulted concerning a purgatory of all things, right? And so we're going to see this a lot in Celtic Christianity. And women were at first uh, chosen as confessors, believe it or not, uh, to, for absolution. Later on, of course, that's going to change to the priests. But I just want to mention uh, that uh, this doesn't happen right away. The idea of confession uh, takes a long time to develop. And that is uh, an, another topic all, altogether. But um, uh, in fact, I'll just bring this up briefly since I know some of you are interested. Uh, what happened is, is that the idea of confessing to a priest doesn't become fully developed uh, in every way in a private sense, a confession, until the 10th century, right? So the New Testament states, uh, the Catholic Church, uh, basically, uh, you have James says, confess your sins to one another. And to Jesus breathing the Holy Spirit to the apostles, saying, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. And that's from John 22. So the early Christian fathers uh, revealed that penance was often confessed uh, after very not such great sins, right? But not on a regular basis. Uh, and oftentimes, this was not done in private. This was done in public. Uh, Augustine mentions this, and, and Caesarinus of Arles mentions this in the 6th century. In the 7th century, at that point, the Council of Toulon-Sardoin, uh, D-A-O-N-E, which uh, met between 644 to 655, testified that but it was useful for the salvation of the faithful when the diocesan bishops prescribed penance to a sinner as many times as he or she would fall into sin. But it was only in the 10th and 11th centuries that individual confessions came about. But it wasn't necessary. And, and of course, the purgatoria idea, which comes from Virgil's Aeneid, right? What happens is that at first, uh, it could be anybody, right? It doesn't have to be a priest. And so, Many, because of this traditional role of women, are you guys following me? Uh, turn to women uh, to pray when it comes to purgatory. And we'll see this as reflected in this talk. Okay, so you got a little overview. You kind of see where we're going. Let's jump into it, and we will. And so, yes, I have details to support everything I just said. <laughs> Here we go. Let's start with Hildegard. Of Bingen. Hildegard of Bingen, uh, born in 1098. Uh, she will pass in 1172. She was born of a noble family uh, to Mithild and Hilbert. Uh, she's the last of 10 children uh, and offered as a special tithe to the church. So she's kind of given up. She had early visions uh, starting at the age of three. By the time she was six years old, she realized she was unique in this gift. Uh, now, her visions uh, impacted all of the senses. And so, in her case, she saw, she heard, she felt, she tasted, she even smelled these visions. Okay. When she had a vision, the experience, she said, would press upon her spirit. But unfortunately, this made her quite ill. And uh, until, of course, she expressed it. So she felt this weight upon her, pushing against her. And until she said what her vision was about, uh, it, it, it contracted her spirit. It made her physically sick. So she had, she believed, to say these visions. Uh, now, uh, she called this the shade of the living light. So she ended up in the monastery of, of St. Disabod, 
Uh, this is a Benedictine monastery. And she, she entered in this monastery at the age of eight. And she was under uh, a, uh, a uh, help out by um, a certain Juta. And Juta is a, or Juta, I'll oh, say it in way, the Juta, uh, she was also a mystic. And Utah, uh, let's talk about Utah a little bit. Uh, much like Hildegard, Utah was a visionary uh, and very intelligent, came from a noble family. Uh, her fa father died when Utah was about three as well. Just, uh, and so the family was presided over by her very strong mother by the name of Sophia. At the age of 12, Utah felt ill, and it looked as if she would not live unless by way of some miracle. So Yuta vowed if she recovered, she would dedicate her life as a clergywoman. And when she did so, she recovered. Well, the family uh, tried to marry her off, as they often would, but she fled uh, to the Bishop of Mainz, and then she took vows. She became an anchorite of St. Sibold Monastery, and she vowed to never leave her cell and dedicated herself to training young girls for holy service. And the, one of the young girls, of course, would be Hildegard of Bingen, right? Yuta practiced, you'll see this a lot with the other uh, female mystics, self-flagellation, uh, where uh, they, they, take a, they take the leather strap and they uh, beat themselves on the back and say various words to punish uh, the evil flesh, the sinful flesh as they saw it, right? Uh, she also was uh, locked herself in chains. And these chains were always on her legs. And uh, sometimes they, they rubbed uh, her, her skin so it became raw, right? She ate very little. Uh, Hildegard stayed with Yuta for about eight years at her cell. Uh, Yuta taught Hildegard a few things. Uh, all I should pay attention here, Yuta taught Hildegard basic Latin. Remember, we just talked about literacy. We're going to see this over and over again. Yes, within a religious environment, a religious community, women would learn how to read and how to write. Right. So she learned basic Latin. She learned uh, gardening, right? Herbal remedies. Uh, which we look at today. We take a look at the various writings of Hildegard. And, uh, you know, she would consider this miraculous. Uh, we would understand this as almost magical. We have to understand context is king, right? Uh, she also uh, learned how to take care of the sick through various natural medicines. Yuta believed to have, uh, believed to have special spiritual powers of healing. Uh, to make those who are sick uh, healed by just her touch. So Hildegard learned so much from her, uh, learned the psaltery, um, uh, which is basically an ancient Greek instrument having 10 strings under Utah. So she learned how to compose music quite a bit. <laughs> Utah learned about uh, what happened is, is that Hildegard started having visions and um, and Yuta listened to these uh, visions and shared these visions with Volmar. Uh, and Volmar later on became Hildegard's confessor at the monastery. Uh, both Yuta and Volmar believed her, uh, her visions were true and encouraged her to write her visions out. In fact, later on, uh, well, even during this time, Volmar became one of her closest friends. And they were friends, best friends, uh, for the next 60 years. Uh, you're going to see this again. Uh, many female mystics will have, uh, uh, you know, male friends. And there's not the thing, in some cases there is, but there's something, there's nothing between them, theoretically. You know, there's this male-female uh, aspect going on there, right? Uh, Hildegard officially took the veil at the age of 14 in 1112 CE. And then, uh, but uh, she really did appreciate Utah, who she called uh, a heavenly orb. Uh, Utah did die at the age of 44. And then 
Hildegard in 1136 took over Utah's place. So she became the mother superior of St. Visible. Now this high position made her visions even more well known, right? As you can imagine, uh, she was believed to have the gift of prophecy where she was able to tell if a person uh, was good or evil in life. Yeah, so she looked at somebody and said, oh, you know, I, you're good. I think that you are naturally evil which didn't make her popular, you know? Uh, she was able, supposedly, to be able to tell if you're going to go to heaven or hell <laughs> uh, based upon this condition. Uh, and the other thing that made her kind of unpopular in this regard is she was able to tell you, or popular, she was able to tell you the person when they were going to die. Um, not sure I want to have uh, that kind of gift. Uh, we do, right? Well, then she had the Great Vision. The Great Vision happened in 1141. Uh, and uh, just like other visionaries throughout the centuries, uh, she said that she was told by God to write down everything she experienced, uh, as opposed to mentioning these visions verbally. And so uh, she wasn't sure if she should do this. But she was told by God, so she wrote the famous Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, the founder of the Cistercian Order, who asked what she should do. Uh, he responded uh, that, well, yeah, um, I, I think your experiences are true. Just be humble about it. And then Bernard went on. Most people, most scholars agree. Uh, he approached the Pope to find out uh, what his opinion of, of Hildegard was. And Pope Eugene the Third. Uh, at this time was the Council of Trier. Uh, he was there between November 1147 to February 1148. And Eugene received uh, also an excerpt, a written excerpt of her visions from what will later on become her first work known as the Schemas. And this is a big moment. Here it is. And he gave her an official papal approval to keep on writing and to publish it. Furthermore, any other visions she experienced were deemed by the Pope as from God. So now, uh, Hildegard of Bingen is empowered with papal authority and that her visions that she experienced uh, are from, from God, uh, from the Spirit, right? And so were deemed as orthodox. This gave her power within the ecclesiastical structure uh, as a mystic, as a prophet. And she will later on give advice to popes and they would listen. Now let's talk about the Scivus. The Scivius is written between 1151 to 1152. It included about 26 of her visions. Um, now at this point, remember Valmar, her trusty companion, or, you know, her confessor. Well, now he's, uh, he, I guess he's still the confessor, but he's also his, uh, her secretary. Uh, and uh, he also helped edit uh, her works. Uh, in fact, uh, he also wrote a work on the life of Utah. And so, so now her close friend, uh, Ricardus von Stad, also helped her edit. It's divided in three parts, uh, symbolizing the Trinity. The first part tells the story of the creation of the cosmos and the fall of humanity. The second part explains how salvation is possible through Christ, the church, and the sacraments. The third part describes the coming heavenly kingdom and how it approaches the tensions between good and evil and how it will become more and more pronounced as the end of the age approaches. When Eve is finally revealed, yes, when Eve, as an Adam and Eve is finally revealed, she is shown as a shining cloud of stars, pregnant with the unborn human race and declared as the mother of all living. You see the heightened aspect of the feminine here, right? But again, here she is. Uh, she is a shining cloud of stars. She's pregnant 
with humanity, all of humanity, right? The mother of all the living. It has almost almost a goddess feel to it, right? Uh, by the way, <laughs> it's kind of bold of, of, of Hildegard, but uh, she also, how do I say this, uh, revealed her disagreement with the Apostle Paul. So Paul states in 1 Corinthians 11, 9, he says, man was not created for woman, but woman for man. She responds instead, woman was created for the sake of man and man for the sake of woman. And so she equalizes the two genders. Right? She he corrects uh, St. Paul in this regards. She also asserted that menstruating women should be allowed to go to the church. There were certain restrictions that uh, if it was that time of the month, you couldn't go to church. You had to stay home or it would defile the holiness, the sanctity uh, of uh, the, the, uh, the church itself, that sacred space. And she says that, no, ridiculous. So she advocated that this needs to end. She also understood the cosmos as a giant cosmic age. As far, far as Sophia, in her mind, wisdom. Uh, he, she, de she depicts wisdom as God's feminine co-worker in creation. Uh, stands atop the house of the seven pillars and is on top and is the tower of the church. In fact, it is the church, okay? Wow, so you're looking at much of what I talked about at the beginning, it's already been proven so much by the life of Hildegard in general, right from the start. She also wrote, wrote something called the Ordo Virtutum. This is the morality play originally uh, in a shorter form at the end of the Scivius, was now its own little special uh, passion play, right? It tells about the anima, uh, the human soul, and its constant struggle between the virtues and the devil. Uh, guess who gets stuck playing the devil? That's right, uh, Volmar. <laughs> See, they actually did this play. They actually did this play, and the, and uh, Volmar, he, I guess he couldn't sing, so he just kind of yelled uh, the devil's line, and, he, and, and after a while, his voice became very gruff. <laughs> so poor Valmar, right? Uh, that's what friends do. You know, can you play the devil? Valmar goes, yeah, yeah, go ahead and do it. Uh, so he did. Uh, so part one begins with the virtues as sung by an all-female chorus introduced before the patriarchs and prophets who were sung by an all-male chorus. Remember, this is the story of the soul, of the anima. In part two, various souls sung by a women's choir uh, seeing about the, their plight of uh, being entrapped in these physical bodies, comparing it to a prison. This, uh, yes, it does sound like aspects of Christianity, but it also uh, sounds like other belief systems too, right? Uh, so uh, the Orphic Mysteries, right, for example, and, and even uh, aspects of Platonism, Gnosticism. So there you have that. Now, enter the star. The star versus anima, the soul, who does not complain like the other souls, but skips about happily, even dances. He is ready to simply move on to heaven. But then the virtues intervene. And then the devil arrives on the scene, who shouts instead of sings his lines. He tempts anima to become corrupt and fall. Uh, and of course, uh, the next part, the virtues are described. And finally, anima. Uh, repents, restored, and the virtues all attack the devil. Oh, there's also uh, a procession. A lot of, of scholars have said this is not just the story of the fall of the soul, but specifically aimed at somebody that was close to her, and that was Ricardus. Remember I told about her? Ricardus von Stott uh, said that she was a very close friend who helped edited her, editing her works. Well, what happens is that um, uh, she loved, this is her close friend. Uh, she compared them like, you know, I'm Paul and you're Timothy. But uh, Ricardus wanted to move up the ladder of authority. And uh, 
and not be under the shadow uh, of, of, of Hildegard. And so she contacted her brother, uh, Hartwig, Archbishop of Bremen. And managed to find an open abbot's position in another monastery in Basel uh, through these connections. Hildegard was very upset at this appointment and tried to have this decision rescinded so that her friend would stay. But um, what happened is, is that she was ordered to stop. The Archbishop of Mainz intervened and the Ricardus went on to this higher position. Well, what happens is, is that she almost immediately died right after getting the position. And on her deathbed, Ricardus wished that she had not done so, that she had listened uh, to Hildegard. Right? So there you have it. So that's Hildegard, of course, obviously. Uh, there's so much more to talk about, right? Uh, um, Hildegard had a preaching tour uh, throughout the 1160s along the Rhine. She was told she could not preach. Uh, she said she was a virgin, and so she could. Uh, in fact, she went around and attacked. I mean, this is this, she's very, very upfront. She went up and down the Rhine and throughout the Holy Roman Empire, talking about how corrupt the Catholic Church had become. And of course, she's getting away with it because, drum roll, please, she has papal sanction. Hello, but she says has authority, so she can. She preached against the Cathars. Uh, because they thought that the flesh was evil. Uh, but she believed specifically that the virgin flesh was good. For after all, the virgin Mary bore Christ. She has also acted as an exorcist during this period of time. Uh, she wrote music. Uh, what fascinates me uh, is her theology of Eve as an Adam and Eve. While Eve initiated the fall, theoretically, the manifestation of sin believed to come through her. Redemption, however, from sin, she talked about, arrived through the Virgin Mary via the birth of Christ. So while sin may have entered in, in connection to Eve into the world, it was also redeemed through the Virgin Mary through the birth of Christ. So she made a parallel that uh, Adam was parallel to the Virgin Mary, and Eve was a parallel uh, with Christ. For Adam, like Mary, gave birth to Eve, and so was the mother of Eve, while Mary gave birth to Christ, right? Because of her ability to bear children, here we go. Hildegard then understood that Eve was the greatest of God's creations. What? Because Eve is able to, and then women subsequently are able to give life. They are life bearers, right? Even though men you know, have a part in that, right? Women are the ones who give birth. You know, so, you know, that function, she said, uh, was the greatest creation. And that made the devil so jealous of Eve and the special gift of her greatness. But, of course, he, she, you know, she said that Eve actually was innocent. You know, it's always Adam's, Adam's one who knew, took of the fruit with knowledge, right? Eve didn't know. She didn't have that knowledge. So who is more guilty, right? The one that had no knowledge, the one who had knowledge. Anyway, but she stressed that restoration also arrives through the body of women. And this is very important, right? Add so much in a theological way uh, for other women who will follow after that, right? Uh, uh, she will um, Die eventually uh, uh, in September of 1179. She died at the age of 81. All right, so we had to make sure we talk about Hildegard. I want to make sure we get enough of these other saints in. We can do a comparison. Oh, you're going to like the next one. The next one is Christina of Market. Christina of Market. Uh, 
1096 to 1155. Uh, she was actually born with the name Theodora uh, in Huntington, England. Uh, she was an anchoress. She was a prioress. Uh, she arrived from a wealthy Anglo-Saxon family uh, that uh, this family tried to accommodate the Normans. And uh, during her life, um, what happened is uh, her mother uh, told a story that she knew that her daughter would be holy because a dove had flown into her sleeve and lived there for seven days while she was pregnant. I'm not sure what I think about this story. I'm thinking, okay, so wait, wait. So her mom is just sitting there and this dove goes into her sleeve and stays there for seven days. I mean, wouldn't you want to... <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure that's a great place for a dove to be. Uh, and, you know, doves do things. But uh, anyway, uh, I, I, it's, it's, maybe it's supposed to be beautiful. I don't know. I don't think so. But there you have it. So, so as, as, a, as, as a child, uh, remember, she's known as Theodora at this time. Uh, it is said that she uh, had conversations with Christ. Uh, and these conversations were as if he were a man whom she could see uh, was described. So, um, so she's talking as, as a kid uh, with Jesus, right? Uh, then she made a friendship with this older man by the name of Suno, who became her first religious mentor. Uh, and uh, the two kind of mutually helped each other. Um, in fact, uh, uh, you know, the thing is, is that he had, he had problems of his own, but he had overcome them and was always encouraging her. Uh, to become better. Uh, one time, uh, a person told her that he, that he was once so infused by lustful desires that he would sleep with anyone, including a leper. This upset her so much that she told that person that if she did not have anything decent to say, that she was not going to listen. Uh, hearing this, uh, Suno's uh, faith was even strengthened. So Theodora visited South Abbey's Abbey um, uh, with her parents as a teenager. And during the visit, uh, uh, she was amazed at the presence of God. She felt God in this place. And she was ignited with a deep sense of faith. And so she made a private vow of chastity at the time as a teenager. Uh, now, what happened is um, when they were leaving, uh, Theodora, who will become known as Christina, uh, scratched the sign of the cross with one of her fingernails on the door so as to mark uh, that in that monastery, in particular, she stowed away her heart's desire. The next day after Mass, uh, she, gave, she went up to the priest and offered a penny saying to herself, for to thee in surrender myself, I offer this penny. Uh, and so she again is giving herself up to God in service. But then while visiting her aunt by the name of, <laughs> interesting name, it's Elf Gufu, Elf Gufu, right? E-L-F-G-I-F-U. So she's visiting her aunt and Theodora, or Christina, right, met Bishop Ranoff. Now, Bishop Ranoff, you got to listen to this. Bishop Ranoff had an interesting relationship with her aunt. In fact, her aunt was the bishop's concubine. And he sought to, what said, to inflict this on Theodora as well. Make her a concubine. Now, the fact that you have a bishop having a concubine. I mean, yeah, your mind's going all over the place on this one. So according to the account, when Ronoff attempted to force his attentions on her, uh, he, in fact, what he did is he arranged for her to meet him in his bedchamber. And uh, then he gave a signal for his attendants to leave. And then what happened is that uh, um, Christina, uh, basically is uh, uh, she was grabbed by Randolph 
And Christina actually uh, ran away, got through the door, turned around and bolted the door and bolted him inside and then fled. Ran off, was so upset that he thought of nothing but revenge and so arranged for her to get married because he wanted to break her idea of chastity. You know? So he arranged for her to be married uh, to a young nobleman by the name of Bertrand. And of course, the parents uh, agreed to this marriage, but Theodore did not. Uh, she did not want to give up her vow. Uh, and so uh, what happened is, is that um, once again, the, the guy that's supposed to be the groom, uh, how this happens is her angry parents arrange for uh, the Bertrand to have access to her room, only to discover the next morning that the two had spent the night discussing religious subjects. On one occasion, Theodora recounted the life of St. Cecilia, who, according to legend, was guarded on her wedding night by a vengeful angel. On another occasion, she hid beneath a tapestry while Bertrand searched for her in vain. So it becomes pretty obvious that this is not going to happen. <laughs> uh, they're not going to consummate the marriage. Uh, and so she eventually fled, found shelter with a certain Roger, a hermit, and subdeacon of St. Albans uh, Abbey. Uh, and so she was there for a while. And she took on this, took off her silk clothes and replaced it by a rough garments. But uh, what happened is this, it's interesting, uh, is that uh, eventually they will give up the search. Uh, and actually after two years, Petron released Christina from the marriage contract and Archbishop Thurston of York formally annulled uh, the marriage in 1122. Uh, so there you have it. But uh, she was still feeling or fighting the temptation. We talked about the temptation stage uh, with demons attacking her. Uh, she went through the stage, right? So, so what happened is, is that uh, she felt this temptation uh, these lustful urges, but then Jesus brought her extraordinary consolation. Uh, Jesus appeared in the guise of a small child. He came to the arms of her sorely tested spouse and remained with her a whole day, not only being felt, but also being seen. The maiden took the child in her hands, gave thanks, and pressed him to her bosom, it says, and with immeasurable delight, she held him at one moment to her virginal breast, and another felt him in her innermost being. So, according to this, the source, what's going on here? Well, she's having lustful desires. So, Jesus appears to her as an infant, and she becomes like this Mary figure, and she holds the infant Jesus and nurses him. And that's squashes this sense of lust that she had. Uh, Christina still retained her appreciation for uh, men's beauty. Uh, and so uh, what happened is she had another situation where three of the young men that uh, basically here, she had a vision that one morning uh, I had an astonishing vision. Behold, they're gathered around her, young men of extraordinary beauty. What a remarkable sign of mercy and divine approval. Three of the young men greeted her. None of them attempted to seduce her. They said, Hail, Virgin of Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, and commanded that greeting to be sent to you. And as a result of this vision, she no longer uh, had any lustful desire. It was quenched. But the devil continued to attack Christina. Uh, when she lay down by herself to sleep, she was troubled, for it seemed to her that the devil might stifle her or by his nefarious arts drag her into some obscene games. But when he was foiled in his unwearying attempts to debauch her mind, the poisonous serpent plotted to break her steadfastness by creating false rumors and spreading abroad unheard of and incredible slanders through the bitter tongue of his agents. The, then the devil sought to uh, seduce her with blasphemy. I mean, she really had to go through uh, all these kinds of, of 
persecutions that she believed came from the devil. But eventually, uh, she succeeded. Wrapped in prayer, she rose to heaven. And her prophetic words seemed to concern sexual temptations. Once again, uh, this seems to be a theme here. Do not be afraid of these horrible temptations, for the key of your heart is in my hand. And the lock of your mind and body is in my custody, and no one can enter unless I allow it. And so there you have it. So definitely uh, a description of the, uh, of the struggles that she went through, but she was considered uh, a mystic, and there's a hagiography that was written about her. Uh, it's pretty realistic when it comes to the way of, uh, of the temptations that she seems to fight. The next one is Christina Parabolus, uh, Christina of the Wonders. Uh, she lived from 1150 to 1224. Uh, she was born uh, in Brustein, uh, near St. Truden in, in Belgium, uh, to pagan parents. These are 1100s, but these are still paganism is, is around. And she found herself an orphan at the age of 15. Uh, she was taking care, care of various herds. Now, then, here we go. You'll like this. This is a very interesting story. When, at the age of 15, she collapsed. Uh, sorry, uh, not 15. Uh, in her early 20s, I apologize. In her early 20s, uh, she collapsed due to a massive seizure. She was declared dead. And so they took her. They washed her body. They placed it into the casket. And they put that, of course, right in front of the church uh, with the open coffin. And, uh, I mean, she was dead, right? dead during the Agnes Dei, right? During the Lamb of God, suddenly she arose full of vigor, stupefying with amazement the whole city of St. Truden. <laughs> so suddenly she pops out of the coffin <laughs> and the whole city is there <laughs> watching this event. <laughs> uh, you know, they all witnessed this wonder. This is where she got her name. According to the story, uh, she supposedly levitated up into the rafters, uh, later explaining that she could not bear the smell of all the sinful people there. <laughs> as for what she experienced while dead, Christina said as follows. So she's telling what happened when she was dead. She said that, that she had witnessed heaven, hell, and purgatory. She said that as soon as her soul was separated from her body, angels conducted it to the very gloomy place entirely filled with souls whose torments endured there. And they were such that it was impossible for them to describe. She claimed that she had been offered a choice, either to remain in heaven or return to earth to perform penance to deliver souls from the flames of purgatory. Did we not talk about this, right? So once again, she's given this choice. You can go to heaven, or you can go to earth, but in order to go to earth, you have to perform penance. And your job is now that you've seen all this, you know, as a witness, you have an obligation to, to help others to avoid purgatory. So Christina agreed to return to life, and she arose in that same moment. She told those around her that for the sole purpose of relief of the departed and conversion of sinners, she returned. Uh, and of course, she was to be the faithful maid that brings people back uh, to faith. At this point, uh, uh, Christina renounced all comforts of life. She reduced herself to extreme uh, destitution. Uh, she wore rags. Uh, she didn't live uh, at a, she didn't live in any location. Uh, she was not uh, accordingly. Uh, she was not content with privations. She eagerly sought all that could cause her suffering. 
Uh, in fact, at first she, she left all human contact. She didn't want to deal with anybody. But, uh, but eventually um, uh, she came back and she realized that her job is to convince others um, that uh, there is a life after death. It's like a, a it's like a path. It's like a, uh, you know, tell them about what happens after death, right? Uh, a certain Thomas Contemporary, who was a canon regular, who was a professor of theology, wrote a report eight years after her death based on accounts of those who knew her, uh, as well as Cardinal Jacques de Vitre, who met her, and said that she would throw herself into a burning furnaces and there suffered great tortures for an extended time. So accordingly, if there's a furnace, she throw herself in the furnace and somehow uh, she would survive. Uh, this one, uh, this is an interesting story. Uh, in winter, she would plunge into the frozen Moose River for hours and even days and weeks at a time. So she plunged herself into this river, not only for hours, but for days and even weeks at a time, all the while praying to God and imploring God's mercy, God's mercy uh, for, for those sinners across, of course, from purgatory into heaven. She sometimes allowed herself to be carried by the currents down the river to a mill where the wheel, quote, whirled her round in a manner frightful to behold. Yet she never suffered any dislocations or broken bones. You know, so, you know, there you have it. Yeah, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah, hey, this picture going down the river and caught the wheel and just like going around and around. <laughs> Somehow uh, she's able to survive, right? Uh, she was also attacked by wild dogs. Beware of that. Uh, she did get herself uh, arrested a few times, um, actually twice. And so she decided to be a little bit more modest uh, in some of her uh, things that she does, right? She died at the Dominican Monastery of St. Catherine in St. Truden of natural causes uh, at the age of 74. <laughs> so she lived a long time. <laughs> so she'd do all these tortures of the show that, you know, that she, I, I guess, well, I mean, she already, you know, died. So I guess, it, you know, I guess it's okay, right? <laughs> so uh, 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 she kept, in a sense, uh, dying uh, to herself uh, through these means. Now, now at this time, during this time, we had those called the Dinguines. Now, Dinguines, uh, basically in the early 12th century, many women began to seek an independent spiritual life. Uh, based upon prayer and caring for others. Uh, and soon these women came together. They banded together uh, because they had these common goals and they formed collectives called binguinages, uh, binguines, right? Each under a grand mistress. Uh, you know, which, and they each had their own unique role. And so uh, often we focus upon a particular means of living. For example, uh, cloth making was very popular in Flanders. And so you're gonna have these collectives of women uh, that uh, are, are cloth makers. That's all that they do as a trade. But at the same time, uh, they would also be a, a prayer group, uh, a religious group, uh, and many of them were mystics, but they were outside of male authority, right? Uh, so they could trade, uh, they could barter, they were active in business, but also active in prayer. They were considered holy women. Uh, and uh, they were believed that through their devotions, they could become closer to God. There are other trades that they, had, they involved themselves in, not just cloth making. Uh, you know, basket making and, and you know, and weaving of different kinds and and uh, there are others beyond that too, but uh, um, ceramics, right? But uh, there are a few of them though, however, uh, you know, they're diversified. There's a few of them that live within these collectives that became full-time mystics, you know, so they, so they are being supported by the other women uh, and then they, they fully uh, focused on the religious life, right? 
Now, what happened, however, uh, is that uh, being uh, being engaged full time uh, as 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 mystics uh, and getting uh, attention for that fact started to run afoul of the church because, you see, the problem is is that if you have independent female mystics, that's independent. But now that the that women are formed into these collectives commune like trade like guild like groups right uh and now women within these groups you know included these mystics now all of a sudden this is an organizational problem right now these are organizations that are supporting these mystics and that uh made the church nervous right you know you can't have that right now many of the big weeds uh, became Franciscans, and they, they, they became part of the third rule of St. Francis. So, so, you know, so that way they have some kind uh, of affiliation that would seem to protect them. Well, here's the problem, and that is uh, uh, the, uh, they became very close to those known as spiritual Franciscans. And spiritual Franciscans uh, what happened is, is that uh, they were the unpopular branch of the Franciscans. Uh, they believed that uh, it was important to go back uh, to uh, live a life like St. Francis, right? Uh, in every way. That means strict poverty and constant preaching and complete humility and looking down upon any kind of possessions whatsoever. And so yeah, you can see where the problem is. Uh, they they like uh, Peter John of Olivi, and so what will happen is the spiritual uh, Franciscans are going to be persecuted by the church because it goes against so much. And so you get the, the regular Franciscans avoid persecution, but the spiritual Franciscans are being persecuted because they're purists, and the spiritual Franciscans then go to the Benguines to be supported, to find support. And so these Benguines hid the spiritual Franciscans from the Inquisition. And they formed uh, this, this line where it's like, a, like, a, like a, a, a passageway from station to station, going from the Holy Roman Empire through France into Spain uh, and into Southern Spain, uh, into Muslim Spain to save the spiritual Franciscans. So it's kind of like this underground like railroad you know one to the other they would smuggle these franciscans that would be a great story <laughs> you know uh to have uh the movie version or a novel version right if you want to write something interesting there it is and so they tried to save uh, these spiritual franciscans unfortunately uh by doing so they are guilty by association and as a result the Benguines started to look dangerous uh, to the papal authorities. And so in 1311, uh, Pope Clement of the V accused the Benguines uh, of spreading heresy, which destabilized the church. Uh, Pope John the uh, 22nd, uh, 1316 to 1334, viewed the lay movement of the Benguines as troublesome for their zeal, uh, susceptible to nation. Um, uh, 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 and so, as a result, the Benguines uh, started to dwindle as a formation. All right, so there you have that. Now, many of the, the mystics that we talk about now uh, are sometimes Benguines. So you'll see that association in just a moment. Beatrice of Nazareth, she lived from 1200 to 1268. She was the very first prose writer to use the Dutch language that is known. Did you guys, did you hear that? The very first prose writer to use the Dutch language that is known. Not, not female writer, just writer in general. Wow, big deal. When Beatrice was seven years old, her mother died, at which point uh, she was sent to her father uh, to live uh, with the Benguines for about a year. Uh, she became very interested in monastic life, wishing to become a nun. When she was 10 years old, her father gave her permission to live 
of the Cistercian nuns at Blumenthal, where uh, she became eventually an oblate. Uh, as a teen, her superior sent her uh, to her neighboring convent to learn the art of manuscript writing. As she met a certain Ida Nevels or Nevia, uh, they became soon became uh, close friends. She had an ecstatic vision of the Trinity, the heavenly Jerusalem, and the choir of angels. After this vision, Beatrice reacted with profound emotion. She wept when she realized that her ecstasy had ceased. But she also had such immense gratitude that she also laughed following the fact that she weeped. Uh, she, she did kind of had a period of time uh, where she uh, fell under the, what's called the wound of sloth, but then she reignited herself uh, with her religious observances and she felt ecstasy once again uh, and did do various extreme acts of asceticism. Uh, she found a, a hamlet of Nazareth, a place uh, for people to meet together. And she always wore a girdle of thorns and, comp and compressed her body with cords. Uh, in her vision, here it is, of Jesus, uh, Jesus was said to appear to her and to have pierced her heart through with a fiery dart. And so... In fact, uh, what happened is her devotion to the Eucharist resulted in bleeding and physical collapse. So uh, now you have this instance of the heart of God, the holy heart of Christ, and it being pierced, right? But also her heart being pierced, and you have the sense of this oneness of the Eucharist that we're going to see more in a few moments. Heide Weich of Antwerp, uh, she was from the 1200s. Uh, unfortunately, uh, no details of her life are known outside the sparse indication of her writings, uh, but we do have quite a bit. And we look and we realize that um, uh, she is influenced by the courtly literature. Yes, uh, she did come from, must have come from a well-off family. Uh, she knew several languages, Latin and French, right? Uh, at some point, uh, she was criticized for her views, uh, perhaps forced out of the big wean community, uh, but she did um, uh, mention various women that uh, she calls the list of the perfect. But what's interesting about her, here we go, uh, is that she focused on the idea of love, you know, me, as they say, right? Which is uh, the focus, love, right? Love. Now, she takes this idea of love, and you see where you have the courtly love theme interacting. But she sees love, lady love, in a different way. You know, of course, obviously, uh, you have this idea of worldly love. But Heidweig, what she did, she talked about the eternal love of God, literally depicting God experienced directly as love. love is a central theme of her poetry. Now, the, the word mean, M-I-N-N-E, this is the feminine noun in the Dutch language. And it connects, of course, to the idea of divine love. It can also be translated as lady love, depending on the context, right? So, so she did experience various visions while young, and she seemed to be very focused on Johannine beliefs and perspectives of the Gospel of John, First John, Second John, Third John, and the Book of Revelation. Right? Uh, she wrote these various letters. Uh, one uh, to a young Benguin who she sought to inform of the primary subjects of faith, and of course, uh, love was a very center of this. Now, what's interesting? Here we go. Uh, in her form of love. She sees us as ecstatic lovers in search of union with God, who is Lady Love. But rather than presenting herself as the bride of Christ, you know, who, and Jesus as the bridegroom, as you so often see, 
uh, you know. Instead, she takes on the idea, here it is, that she has the image of a knight. Yes, as a knight in shining armor, as a knight journeying through the wilderness of love, right? <laughs> now, just, just, so now you have this idea of the divine feminine, which is love, personified as a female, but she personifies herself as the male knight <laughs> that is in search of the female divine love. It's just amazing. I'm going to read you a little bit of this here. Um, uh, she writes, What is sweetest in love is her temptuousness. Her deepest abyss is her most beautiful form. To lose one's way in her is to touch her close at hand. To die of hunger for her is to feed and taste. We can say yet more about love. Her wealth is her lack of everything. Her truest fidelity brings about our fall. Her highest being drowns us in the depths. Her revelation is total hiding of herself. Her gifts, besides, are thieveries. Her promises are all seductions. Her ornaments are all undressing. Her truth is all deception. To many, her assurances appear to lie. This is the witness that can be truly born at any moment by me and many others to whom love has often shown wonders by which we were mocked, imagining we possessed what she kept back for herself after she first played these tricks on me and I considered all her methods. I went to work in an entirely different way. By her threats and her promises, I was no longer deceived. I will belong to her, whatever she may be, gracious or merciless to me, it is all one. Whoa. He also writes about the madness of love. And yet this love is God. Well, then we have the town of Hackborn. She lived from 1240 to 1298. Uh, she was a Saxon mystic. Uh, she was so fragile at birth that her attendants, uh, fearing that she may die unbaptized, hurried her off to the priest who was just preparing the same mass uh, to have her baptized. Well, she was baptized, uh, and the priest said, this child most certainly will not die, but she will become a saintly religious in whom God will work many wonders. Uh, Ten years later, she followed her sister, who was an abbess, uh, to a monastery at Helfta. She was distinguished for her humility, her fervor, and uh, she was famous for her musical talents. She was called a nightingale. Now, uh, what happens is that uh, uh, souls, uh, interesting that uh, she was very spiritual to the point where, because of her mysticism, she was asked for advice. In fact, learned Dominicans consulted her on various spiritual matters. Now, the Lord would say to Mithild, every time you have and by which you can please me, you have for me and through me. In one vision, she perceived that the smallest details of creation are reflected in the Holy Trinity by means of the humanity of Christ because it is from the same earth that produced them that which grew humanity. Right. So Mithad became an ardent devotee and promoter of the idea of Jesus's heart after it was subject of many visions. So you have this idea uh, that's cultivated of the sacred heart. Uh, so the Eucharist heart. Right. So in one vision, Mithad reported that Jesus said, in the morning, let your first act be to greet my heart. And offer me your own. Whoever breathes a sigh towards me draws me to yourself. But what I found is really interesting is in this heart idea uh, is that she looked at the heart as a uh, heart of Christ as a breast, the, as the breast of Christ. And in one takes the Eucharist, one 
suckles the heart of Christ through the Eucharist. And you can see the connection here that, uh, that uh, you have this concept here uh, that uh, the breast uh, is given to the child for, for milk and nutrition and nourishment. So is the Eucharist. And so there you have it. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, then you have Margaret Porte. Margaret Porte, 1248 to 1310, was a mystic from the Holy Roman Empire. Um, she's connected to the Binguin movement. And she wrote a work which is known as the Mirror of Simple Souls in the 1290s. Uh, it was deemed, unfortunately, as heretical. Now, the title of Porte's book refers to the simple soul, which is united with God, right? United with God and has no will other than God's own, right? Some of the language, as well as the format of the dialogue between the characters, such as love, virtue, and the soul, Reflect, reflects a familiarity with the style of courtly love. Uh, Margaret ultimately says that the soul must give up reason, whose logical, conventional grasp of reality cannot fully comprehend God and the presence of divine love. And so one must become the annihilated soul. And so one has to give up everything but love of God. For Purite, when the soul is truly full of God's love, it is united with God and thus in a state of union, which causes it to transcend the contradictions of this world. Now, what is she saying here? In this state, at this moment, she says that when one is united in this mystical sense, when the subject and object become one, we talked about this, the various steps, right? One with God, one cannot sin. What? If you become one with God, you cannot sin at that moment because God cannot sin. So you are pure and perfect, which means that anything you say during that mystical moment of oneness uh, is from God speaking, God speaking through you, and therefore sanctified and beyond question. You can see where the church is going, uh-oh, <laughs> what are you saying here, right? Uh, and so this idea of love, uh, of course, is the highest expression. In many cases, of course, you will quote uh, the first epistle of John, you know, John says, uh, beloved, let us love one another, for love cometh of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Okay, so she says, I am God. What? She says, I am God, says love, for love is God, and God is love, and this soul is God by the condition of love. I am God by divine nature. And this soul is God by the condition of love. Thus, this precious beloved of mine is taught and guided by me without herself, for she is transformed into me, and such a perfect one, says love, takes my nourishment. So, so as a result, she ran into trouble with the authorities uh, in her description of the soul in the state being above the worldly dialectic of conventional morality and the teachings of the traditional church. Uh, she argued that the soul in the sublime state is above the demands of ordinary virtue. Uh, it is the exalted. It is the annihilated soul. It is the perfect union with him, no longer capable of evil or sin. Now, she's condemned for this, which is interesting because uh, 200 years, years later, just 200 years later, St. John of the Cross expressed the same identical view, uh, the nature of the soul's union with God in his ascent of Mount Carmel, and yet he's not denounced, he's not heretical, but the times were changing, right? 
And of course, uh, women's roles were changing at this time too. Well, she was told to retract her book and she refused to do so. In 1308, she was arrested by the local inquisitor. Uh, she uh, refused to speak to the inquisitors. Uh, and eventually she was found, because she did not confess, because she said, I'm not guilty, right? uh, she was found guilty and she was burned at the stake. We have also, we'll do a few more. Uh, we have Gertrude of Health. I want to make sure uh, there's one I really want to make sure we get to before we go. Yeah, okay. We're going to go. We're going to go pretty deep here. Okay. Gertrude of Health. 1256 to 1302. She was a German Benedictine mystic. Uh, Gertrude entered the monastery of St. Hilfta at the ripe age of four for instruction under St. Milton, who we talked about earlier. Uh, in 1281, uh, when she turned 25, Gertrude experienced the first of a series of visions that continue throughout her life. If you're wondering, I I've been quoting most of the time from these works. <laughs> uh, so you're hearing it directly here. Uh, Gertrude writes uh, in the Herald of Divine Love, at the sacred hour, then I was standing in the middle of the dormitory, an older nun was approaching, and having bowed my head with reverence as prescribed by our rule, I looked up and I saw a youth standing before me, about 16 years old, handsome and gracious. As young as I was then, the beauty of his form was all I could have desired, entirely pleasing to the outward eye. Uh, in a gentle voice, he said to me, soon will come your salvation. Why are you so sad? Is it because you have no one to confide uh, that you are so sorrowful? And he, he says, I will save you. I will deliver you. Do not fear. With this, I saw his hand, tender and fine, holding mine. He said, Come back to me now, and I will inebriate you with the with these words. I will inebriate you with the torrent of my divine pleasure. As he was saying this, I looked, and I saw between him and me, this is to say, on the right and the left, a hedge of such length that I could not see the end of it, either ahead or behind. The top of his head was bristling. With such large thorns, there seemed to be no way back to the youth. As I hesitated, burning with desire and almost fainting, suddenly he seized me and lifted me up with the greatest ease and placed me beside him. But with the hand he had just given me, he promised I recognized those bright jewels of his wounds, which had canceled our debts. So, so he, this youth, lifted her above this thorny hedge and he, as a result she saw that his hands were pierced right Gertrude devoted herself strongly to personal prayer she practiced a spirituality called nuptial mysticism and so she believed with this nuptial mysticism that she became the bride of Christ and there of course there are many examples of this union with Christ in her writings, you know, so he, she says, nevertheless, my most living Jesus, in this condition, nor any wretchedness of mine prevented you from favoring me with your visible presence on the days I approach your body and blood, although it was like seeing you in the dim of the dawn. With this loving courtesy, you drew my soul toward you to the touch of a more intimate union, a more discerning contemplation a freer enjoyment of your gifts. She wrote what Jesus was said to inspire her to do. She felt very productive, but also very much loved. Uh, to this, she exclaims, thus in your incessant zeal for my soul, you allow me to enjoy at times the delightful embraces of Rachel without depriving me, however, of the glorious fecundity of Leah. Gertrude becomes then the bride of Christ as she writes on the occasion when the monastery was under interdict. We talked about this uh, in a moment, but she will she says as follows. <laughs> okay, this has a lot of symbolism, 
So um, uh, I'm going to read this slowly, and um, and you'll see what I mean here. He says, "I will." Oh, here it goes. I will increase my pleasure in you, just as the bridegroom can take more pleasure in private than in public. So likewise, your signs and desolation will be by my pleasure. The love you have for me will be increased in you, just as pent-up fire burns more extensively. Moreover, just as a swollen torrent of water breaks forth, and overcomes its banks, gaining greater force by being held back. So my delight in you and your love for me will break forth and overflow. <laughs> so, um, so there you have that. So it's pretty pretty passionate uh, uh, conversation here. With, with so when I'm saying bride of Christ, I'm meaning you know. Um, Bride of Christ, uh, including the consummation of that, right? So, I mean, you can, in a spiritual sense, but using these uh, kinds of, of words that sometimes may be blush, like right now. Okay, so, so the monastery was under interdict. This is a mode of punishment placed on by the church so that the Eucharist sacrament does not work. So they're being punished. Uh, some say it's because of land right disputes. And so that means that um, they, 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 you know, they can't take the Eucharist. They can't have that blessing. You know, they can't interact. So what should you do? So what happens is this. He figures out a way to, for, for, for even though uh, her, the nuns of her, of her group cannot participate in the Eucharist, he figures out a way where they can participate with the Eucharist. So as the priest does his oblation, Gertrude then gives an oblation and Christ receiving the Eucharist legitimizes her offer, thus her divine intimacy is shared with the other nuns of the community. Wait, so wait, what are you saying? Well, in other words, she goes into this union with Christ during the time of the Eucharist. So they're watching the Eucharist. They can't participate because, you know, they're forbidden to do so during because of the internet. They're watching the Eucharist. They can't participate. But what she does, she goes into her mystical union with Christ. And because it is Christ that is going through uh, the Eucharist, right? The body and blood of Christ uh, is being connected and the grace is covering uh those who are participating through the means of her body in connection to Christ, the grace of the Eucharist moves through her mystically and goes to those who were previously forbidden to take the actual Eucharist, but are still taking it spiritually uh, through her body. <laughs> uh, through means of her body. This is fascinating. I mean, this is like really deep. <laughs> uh, so there you have it. Uh, she also taught her fellow nuns uh, many devotional meditations. It was on the most sacred night in which the sweet dew, a divine grace, fell on all the world, and the heavens dropped sweetness that my soul exposed like a mystic fleece in the court of the monastery, having received the meditation, the celestial rain was prepared to assist at this divine birth at which a virgin brought forth the sun, a true God and man, even as a star produces its rays. Okay, so lots of imagery there. Too much to comment on. Uh, but, uh, you know, there, there you have it, right? Um, okay, so two more, but we're almost done. Uh, Julian of Norwich, uh, 1342 to 1416. Uh, she was an English anchoress. Uh, she wrote her Re Revelations of Love, uh, which is the first book of the English language known to have been written by a woman. Once again, 1395. At the age of 30, while still living at home, Julian suffered 
uh, from a serious illness and she was near death. But uh, when she was um, losing her sight, feeling physically numb, she gazed at the crucifix and she saw the figure of Jesus begin to bleed. Over the next several hours, she had a series of 16 visions of Jesus Christ, which ended uh, by the time her illness uh, concluded. And so she wrote these down. Uh, and these are famous. Julian came to such a sense of the awfulness of sin that she reckoned that the pains of hell are to be chosen in preference to it. Julian believed that sin was necessary because it brings people to self-knowledge, uh, which leads to acceptance of the role of Christ in their life. But she also, according to Julian, saw God as both our mother and our father. Uh, some people say this is metaphor rather than uh, literal belief, but, but other scholars say, well, no, Julia emphasized this by explaining how the bond between mother and child is the only earthly relationship that comes closest to the relationship of a person with Christ. So the closest you can come is the mother-child relationship, a father-child relationship, but there you have it. Then you have St. Catherine of Siena. I've actually seen Catherine, not in a mystical vision, but when I was at Siena, I saw her skull. It, uh, it's all kind of together there. Uh, I love uh, her. I wanted to make sure I got to her. Uh, she was a priority on my list. Uh, so Katharina, right, was born during the time of the Black Death, uh, had descended upon Siena. Uh, her father was a cloth buyer, ran his enterprise with the help of his sons. His mother was Lapa, um, the daughter of a local poet. Um, now, what happened is that um, her mom had 22 children. 22 children. That's a lot of kids. Half of them did die. And uh, and she was, um, in fact, uh, his mom, her mom gave birth to her when she was 40 years old. It was also twins. The, tw the twin died, uh, but Katharina lived. Uh, and um, as a child, she was very merry, so happy that she got the name Euphrosin, which is Greek for joy. Uh, so she was known as the joyful one. Catherine is said by her confessor. Uh, and biographer, Raymond of Capitacchio, to have had her first vision of Christ when she was age of five or six. Uh, she had a vision of Christ seated in glory with the apostle Peter, Paul, and John. At seven, uh, Katharina vowed to give her life to God. Uh, her older sister, Bonaventure, died in childbirth. And so uh, what happened is, is that they said, well, I guess now the the, the he's you know her her husband needs to get married and says well why don't you marry the sister Katharina? Uh, she was absolutely opposed to marrying uh, her her, uh, her her sister's former husband uh, and uh, and so she cut off all her long hair as a protest and she tried everything uh, to not uh, attract uh, a husband. Uh, and, and but they continued to push on her uh, to uh, to get married. And so what she did is, as a teenager, she taught herself to build a cell inside of your mind from which you can never flee. And she built herself this inner cell to protect herself. Uh, she had various visions of St. Dominic and so forth. But what happens, and I, I want to make sure that we get here, uh, is that... Um, uh, is that eventually her parents give in uh, and she becomes part of the Dominican order. Uh, and, um, and then she lived at home for a period of time, even though she's part of the order. And she had this custom of giving away her clothes and food and anything else, but she didn't need anything, right? And then when, in 1368, about 21 years of age, Catherine experienced what she described in her letters as a mystical marriage with Jesus. 
And uh, it was this fusion. Uh, now, underlying the extent to which the marriage was a fusion with Christ in the physical sense, Catherine received not the ring of gold and jewels that her biography reports, but the ring of Christ's foreskin. Um, again, you have this very direct idea of marriage to Christ, right? There you have it. But uh, what happened is that she became drawn into the wider and wild world of politics because of her prominent position as a mystic and everybody just like Hildegard of, of Bingen came to her for advice uh, so one case uh, um, she was asked uh, to um, uh, this is a long story here but in June of 1376 Caterina went to Avignon as an ambassador of Florence to make peace with the papal states uh, because Florence had been placed under an interdict. She was unsuccessful and was, you know, disowned by the Florentine leaders, who then sent ambassadors to negotiate their own terms of peace. And then it was agreed upon. But she did kind of pave the way for that peace. In fact, she worked very hard with, you have something called, uh, it's, it's, it's the Babylonian captivity in a sense. It, uh, cap, uh, basically, the, pap the papacy was moved over to Avignon, uh, in, in southern France, and that's where the Pope was, uh, under, in a sense, French control. Her focus was on bringing the Pope back to Rome from Avignon. Uh, in fact, uh, she spent so much time and energy trying to convince the Pope to return. Gregory did indeed return his administration to Rome, in January of 1377, how much she had influenced this decision is under debate. But she was used uh, as an ambassador, as an emissary, because of her mysticism, because she was believed to have the special relationship with, with Jesus, with God. Uh, it was believed that uh, she could be a leader. She could, uh, she, and she did take that. In fact, uh, in late November 1378, uh, with the break of the Western Schism, the new Pope, Urban, summoned her to Rome. She stayed at, at, uh, at his court and tried to convince nobles and cardinals of his legitimacy, both meeting with individuals at the court and writing letters to persuade others. And so uh, she was instrumental in legitimizing the, wait, instrumental in legitimizing the papacy. Are you understanding me? Are you following me? So when it comes to, um, yes, women oftentimes did not have positions of authority. But through the mysticos, through uh, the idea of moving God, connecting Christ, connecting with the mystic, with the female mystic, they thereby gained authority as a result. Unfortunately for her, um, she became very weak. Because she didn't, she didn't eat much. Um, she couldn't swallow anything, not even water. She lost the use of her legs. They begged her. They really loved her. They begged her to, to eat at least, to drink and take some substance. But she died. And of course, there are others, uh, mystics after that. I didn't have time for Teresa of Avila. Oh, that, of course, moves us into the 1500s. But what I want you to understand uh, in closing, and we are closing now, right, uh, is the fact that, that these, these women did, in many cases, gain positions of authority because it was, they were not placed in those positions because of any anointing through the ecclesiastical structure. But through the perceived anointing of God, uh, through the Spirit of God, and be, and and so it's kind of like, well, are you going to question me and my authority? Where for you it comes from God uh, to the ecclesiastical authorities, and then of course to whoever's designated uh, as a bishop or a priest or whatever official. Right here, I'm getting my seal directly from God. 
And there is such a strong precedent for this in the New Testament, right? You know, you have, uh, so, and you have, of course, the famous prophetesses uh, that, that, we, that we see um, uh, that, uh, of, of course, of Philip, right? The prophetesses, uh, you know, and so the role of prophecy in the early church was a very strong one. Uh, at first, you know, the old tripart division of the church was not bishops and presbyters and deacons. What it was instead was apostles and prophets and teachers. And yes, uh, apostles, uh, you know, and, and teachers could be designated, but prophets were always called, well, apostles too, but apostles, prophets are always called directly uh, by God. That's where the designation came. Because the prophets go all the way back, obviously, to the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew prophets, are right? you guys following me? Uh, and so, so, so this idea is very strong within the church, within the New Testament. And so, so these mystics had precedents. And so for a while, for a short period of time, for this window of opportunity, these women were able to gain a significant amount of influence and power, but things do change. And one of the biggest changes was the 1300s. You have the Black Plague. And what I find is interesting, and the women were oftentimes uh, uh, scapegoat. What I find is interesting is that Hildegard of Bingen is very much considered a saint. And yet, you know, she's living, she's, you know, in, you know, in 1100s, right? 1100s. What's interesting is if you took her exactly what she did, what, what she did, everything that she does, what she represents, and you placed her into the 1300s, she would not be considered a saint. She would be considered a heretic, maybe even a witch, just because of the change of the society around it. The 1300s uh, is that change point, that transition. Uh, but for a little while, you certainly had many prominent uh, female mystics that actively engaged uh, in, uh, in, in theology uh, and also expanded upon this idea of love, this union with Christ, and the idea that even the divine feminine could transcend uh, within Christianity and be participated in and uh, be embraced. Thank you so much. That's it. <laughs>